Well, I think we've got a good idea of who the Pac-12 might add in this round of realignment, but they should keep an eye on the future as well. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Lockdown Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day if you're watching on YouTube, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with our beloved Conference of Champions. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show. Five star reviews on Apple Podcasts, those don't hurt either. Or if you think it's four, that's okay. Both are blue chip prospects. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel. Fandle.com slash locked on today to get started. So my suspicions are that in this round of realignment, whenever it gets announced and look, April starts tomorrow, the next meeting of Pac-12 CEOs and the board or whatever you want to call them is April 10th. Will we have to wait until then? Will we have a deal by then? I don't know. It kind of seemed, well, like we're going to talk about later in the show, that the Pac-12 was on the cusp when you had a Utah athletic director, Mark Harlan. You had Arizona's President Robbins, Arizona State's President Michael Crow. Uh, he, you know, they, they were all making comments at the same time that looked like, oh, yeah, no, no, we're in the final stages. Like, okay, guys, like, at, at some point, you know, they are, they are Lucy and we are all Charlie Brown with uh, the football here. But I, I want to talk about the future beyond the short-term future here, because the Pac-12 made a mistake a couple of years ago, which in hindsight, everyone loves to pile on George Klyovkov and the conference writ large and say, look at how you messed up, you made this mistake and all that sort of stuff. And anybody who's doing that saying, you know, you messed up not adding uh, Houston when you had the chance or not adding, you know, Big 12 schools when uh, the SEC came calling for Texas and Oklahoma, Anybody who did that, I would just like to see the receipts of you actively lobbying for the Pac-12 to add schools back in 2021. Because personally, I'm not going to sit here and rewrite history or tell you that I thought something that I didn't actually think. I very easily could, but I try to be as honest with you at all times as I possibly can without, you know, sharing personal information or whatnot, I'm always being honest on here. And I didn't think that back then. Because in 2021, when they announced Texas and Oklahoma were going to the SEC, I did not have the thought that the Pac-12 was in a position of need to go after schools in the Big 12. Knowing what I know now, it would have been a good idea. But I didn't think that at the time. And I don't think a lot of people thought that at the time. There may have been a handful here and there. But Bottom line, the Pac-12 has to be able to look back at the way things have transpired and say, okay, we should have done that in retrospect. Because now going forward, you know, whether now or in the future, they're looking at schools that are maybe not as highly sought after, except for maybe San Diego State, when you're talking about adding G5 schools in realignment to bring them up to the Power 5 level. So, I think the Pac-12 needs to do that. You know, they, they had the chance a, a couple of years ago. They opted to stand pat. And I do feel it's important to remind you that it was USC's president who at the time said, no, why are we doing this? Let's not expand. Let's not do that. All the while working on moving to the Big Ten, which is pretty slimy, if you ask me. But USC and UCLA both were involved in that, but USC was apparently leading the charge. Don't need to rehash all that sort of stuff. It's left us in this situation right now. Also, I'm recording this on opening day. Go Mariners, baby. Uh, forever and always. Go Mariners. Uh, gosh, I'm so excited for this year. I really hope by the time you're listening to or watching this, the Mariners have picked up a day one win over the Cleveland Guardians. So let's let's shift to the future now and look beyond. Let, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that my premise is correct, that San Diego State and SMU are going to be the newest members of the Pac-12 along with a media deal, and they'll be in the range of the Big 12, and they'll go forward, and it'll be about a five- or six-year deal. When the next media deal expires and is up for renegotiation, I don't think alignment or realignment, rather, talk is going to have quieted down. It feels like it has, at least at this point in time, a lot of staying power. 
across the country. And I think if you're the Pac-12, you have to look at what happened and say, okay, we always need to be thinking about what could be coming next. What could happen in the future? What moves could we made? How defensive do we want to be? How aggressive do we want to be? So that brings me to uh, the, the first, or I guess second subject of today's episode, which is the schools that over the next Let's say it's a six-year deal, which has been my official prediction here on Locked On Pac-12 for quite a while. Let's say in the next six years, here are programs to monitor as potential Pac-12 expansion candidates. Not now, because I think right now they're going to stay at 12. I think that's what they would like to do. I think it makes the most sense. I could see 14 happening. I think 14 and staying at 10 are... Not equally as likely. I think going to 14 is more likely than going to 10. I really don't think they're going to not expand and you know pass on the opportunity to add San Diego State, whose value is even higher now that they are in the Final Four tomorrow, potentially the national championship game for men's basketball, which I know is not as big as football, but still, they've had a lot of success there as well. So the the, the time is now to add San Diego State, and I don't think they're going to pass that up. Plus, there was George Klyovkov meeting with SMU uh, months ago, feels like years ago, and whatnot. But there are other teams. And a quick note on the, uh, the, the expansion front, because you'll hear me mention this a lot, because it's important to the Pac-12, but as I'm about to lay out, not vital. The AAU label, the American Association of Universities, which is which is essentially a prestigious academic label, an alliance of schools who are working together to further their academic and research missions. That is something the Pac-12 values highly. However, it is a point in a school's favor for expansion. It is not a requirement. I'm going to say that again. It's a point in a school's favor, clearly, because it represents a cultural fit. It's not a requirement. Utah was not an AAU school when they got added. They became that, I believe, within some time within the last couple of years. But there are still three schools, Washington State, Oregon State, Arizona State, that are not AAU members, still in the conference, and have a future in the league. So let's begin with Tulane. And Tulane, down in Louisiana is an AU member, an R1 institution, and has got athletics that are on the rise. And that win against USC in the Cotton Bowl, that was a big deal. That was a big, big deal. Now, it was on the heels of a 2-10 and 10 football season in the American Conference. But now that the American Conference is getting gutted by the Big 12 with Cincinnati, UCF, and Houston all going to the Big 12 ahead of this season, or for, for next season, that is. So yeah, ahead of this season, you know what I mean. Tulane has the potential to raise their athletic profile significantly. And it, even more so if SMU gets poached by the Pac-12. Because then it would open the door dramatically for Tulane to be one of the flagship institutions of the American Conference. Which as we see with all the additions that the Big 12 just made is a league that has the sort of history and pedigree to send schools to the Power 5 level. It's happened before. No reason to think it can't happen again. So that is definitely, if they can continue to have a high level of athletic success, and that win is important, right? But, you know, Boise State beating Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl was massive for the university, for the program going forward. But then they were able to parlay that into a prolonged run of success on the national level. That's what Tulane's going to attempt to do here. But they're not the only school the Pac-12 should look at. And you can't bet whether or not those schools will go in. Or maybe you can. You'd have to check out FanDuel to figure it out. The tournament is heating up back tomorrow for the Final Four. Women's Final Four taking place today. There's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel. Speaking of the Women's Final Four, Caitlin Clark, whew, baller absolute baller. America's number one sports book, though, is FanDuel, kind of like Caitlin Clark is women's basketball's Amer or number one player in America right now. And right now, FanDuel's giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 in bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get your no-sweat first bet when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Okay, so uh, Tulane is 
one school definitely to watch. And and if if the conference were to go to 14 right now, Tulane and Rice would probably be the two that they'd at least be in the mix. They would at the very least they would be in the mix. Now, this goes back to the Pac-12 learning from its, you know, hindsight mistake of not adding teams in 2021. You're left with schools like Rice, who's the number two university in Houston from an athletic standpoint, and they're even further down on the rung, you know, athletically. But Rice is a name to keep your eye on because they're an AAU member. They've got elite academics. They're 100% a cultural fit in the Pac-12. They get you in the state of Texas, which as we know, and as I was talking about the other day with SMU, has inherent value of just having teams there, whether it's time zone, market presence, whatever. Rice has some value on that front, but their athletics need to step it up. They would need to, to step it up big time before that would happen, or at least when I, if, if I were to feel excited about it, right? The Pac-12 presidents, you know, they might look at it and say, yeah, Rice is a cultural and academic fit. We're going to add them and see if they can make that, that sort of jump. That'd be betting on quite a bit. But Rice, if you didn't know, currently a member of Conference USA, they are off to the American Conference. So they have the same sort of opportunity here. And their athletics in Conference USA have not been very good, specifically on the football front. They've been pretty darn bad. They've been like the UNLV of Conference USA. There's no real reason they shouldn't be better other than they just haven't been able to put it together with any sort of consistency or competing at a high level. But they too are going into the American. So if they start having a higher level of success there, that's a stock that could go on the rise. They've got a lot of room to grow athletically, but they have a number of other factors, like I talked about, working in their favor. AAU, academics, uh, I believe they're an R1 institution. That's an assumption. I forgot to look that up. Uh, but you know, one of you can on, on YouTube and such. But uh, they're also in the, the state of Texas, of course. Now, another school that I talked about for this round, I don't think they're getting added, is UNLV. They are not an AAU member. But as I said, that's a point in your favor, not a requirement. There are three current schools that are foundational to what the conference is going to do going forward, Oregon State, Washington State, ASU, that are not AU members. So that's not a requirement. It's something that they like. It's also something that can be attained, as Utah did from their time joining the Pac-12. UNLV is, however, an R1 institution, which we know matters. Now, the question for UNLV is, number one, can they start competing athletically at a higher level? Their men's basketball team was better this year, but football, we'll see how Barry Odom does. And number two, the question is, how valuable is the Las Vegas media market to network executives, Pac-12 presidents, and everybody else that might be interested in that sort of stuff, you know, or, you know, the uh, the people at whichever streaming entity is involved with the Pac-12's media deal. So that's a name to follow. Colorado State, that's an R1 school. Again, like UNLV, not an AAU member, but a academics are not seen as a hurdle there the way they are at Boise State and Fresno State, for instance, which many of you may know is th th those would be two of my top options. Like if I had my choice of who to add for the Pac-12, I'd go four teams. I'd go Boise State, Fresno State, San Diego State, and SMU. Those would be my, my top four, but that's if you're just looking at athletics and not factoring in, you know, a huge other piece of the puzzle that to university presidents has a lot more value, which is academic. So Colorado State could be one to watch. The thing with them is, you know, how valuable is the state of Colorado? It's one reason that, you know, Utah State could be an interesting one, right? They were just, they've had some good football seasons. They were just in March Madness. They, they've been a solid athletics program, but if you're in a state that doesn't have a ton of, of people and therefore a ton of, of high school talent in it and isn't like the biggest media market appeal, I, I wonder how appealing that is for a conference to go into with more than more than one team, right? Like it's Utah and it's just Utah. It's Colorado and it's just Colorado. Would they go with Colorado State or Utah State? I, I tend to lean towards no, but that that could change. That could change in uh, six years or so. But something to follow there. A uh, couple more Texas schools who are American bound. Uh, I believe North Texas is, but them and uh, UTSA. Uh, let me let me double check that on North Texas real quick. Um, uh, yeah, so North Texas is going to the American on uh, July first, along with UTSA. 
I, I think any of those schools could be could be options. And I'm just saying these are athletics programs that you want to follow. That if they pick up a win, like had most people even heard of Tulane before they went to the Cotton Bowl and beat USC? People might have heard of them, but were they on anybody's radar? Not like that. If one of these programs picks up one of those wins or several of those wins over the course of a couple of years, that's the point I'm making today. They are schools to keep an eye on for the next round because I think this is just kind of the world of college sports. It's always existed at some level, but I think the Texas, Oklahoma, USC, UCLA moves have really accelerated that in, in a big way. And the, the growth of college sports continues to be on an upward trajectory, and, and television ratings often reflect that. You look at now versus 10 years ago, it's big-time growth. That's why these media deals are, are so much more valuable than they used to be. That could be something that 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 or they're, they're, those could be schools that the Pac-12 could could be watching for, and so I, I I just I don't know how it ends. Maybe one day it ends with a two conference situation where you just have you know the Big Ten, the SEC, and everything else is done. I I don't think that's right now. That could be thirty years from now, but I'm talking to the next ten to fifteen. I think these are all schools to keep your eye on. Uh, number or, or the last two here, these are these are outside the box. And I'm curious to see what, what you all think about this. And I love your guys' comments. I love the energy, love the passion. A lot of you have, have great insights sometimes. Some of you are just on there to troll. But you know what? I, I realize that that's part of the deal here. That's it's part of the shtick. That's okay. So the two schools I'm going to throw out here are Memphis and South Florida. Yep. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But... Look at the schools that are remaining in the American Conference without Cincinnati, UCF, and Houston. The biggest brands left in there right now are easily Memphis and SMU. And Memphis and South Florida, the two schools I'm mentioning here, are a long ways away. I'm not going to argue with you there. It, would, it could be a hassle. But... But, but, I wonder if the Pac-12's mindset at all changes between now and when the upcoming media deal expires. A lot can change between now and then. In the last media deal, no one was talking about USC and UCLA leaving. Well, here we are. And I, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if the Pac-12 presidents ever decided they wanted to completely forego the geographical concerns and the regionality of the sport, and they wanted to expand out east beyond the state of Texas, those would be schools I would watch for. I, 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 would, I would keep your eye on it just as a back burner, 2% chance of it ever happening, just a thought that I don't think is the most ridiculous thing in in the world. But I am most intrigued to see how these schools are viewed, how they perform athletically, what their profile looks like. But a, a couple of them might be more worthy of keeping your eye on than others. And, and I'll tell you why. Well, that reason doesn't actually have to do with Built Bars, but the Built March Madness bracket is here. Today's the last day, if you're listening to this on Friday, that you can go in and vote. We know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know I've already voted for the Mint Brownie Bar going all the way. You should go pick your favorite bar or puff because when you do, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only that, one Locked On fan will win a 12-month subscription to Built and have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. You got to try Built. They are the best. Run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff. Pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March, so hop in and support your pick. So the schools of the ones that I laid out there, I think Tulane is the highest profile right now from an athletic standpoint that could change but I would watch for any of the schools I listed that are in the state of Texas and if SMU gets added I think that it'll be a case study for how appealing just being in the state can be 
to the Pac-12. Because right now, SMU is not a top five brand in the state of Texas. But if just being there, like if the state is so big and football is so big and having you know more games available in that time slot in the central time zone, if that is you know a great appeal, then you may see them overlook a school like UNLV who they might want to add and they might say, we want to be in the state of Texas and have games in this time zone. Now, Tulane could still fit the bill there because they're also in the central time zone in Louisiana, but the, the value of the state of Texas itself, Tulane's a different market, but do they want to double down on it? I think depending on how potentially the SMU edition goes will determine how the league might view those other schools down the line. But I think there are some intriguing options and, and the the shakeups that are in the American conference un, that they're going to undergo this year, I, I think they're, they're something to follow. And, and I think any one of them, frankly, could rise up and, and you know, really proclaim itself as destined to be a future Pac-12 edition way down the line. But right now, you'd say the leader of that group would be Tulane, but there's still more information to gather, still more time uh, to pass. So I, I think those are all interesting options. If you've got questions about any of that, thoughts, comments, by all means, hop in the YouTube comments or send me a note uh, at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12. I love hearing from you guys out there. So uh, final thought on today's show. You know, I, I did a show recently, again, that I 100% believed that it looked like the Pac-12 media deal was imminent because we were seeing all these coordinated, seemingly, at least from a timing standpoint, comments from Mark Harlan at Utah, President Crow at Arizona State, and President Robbins at Arizona, who whose schools have been thrown around as, you know, the four corner schools and they're going to the Big 12 or they want the Big 12 or they're going to do this and yada, yada. And they were, you know, really trying to fan the flames on that particular fire. Mark Harlan was doing so the, the most directly. And so President Robbins like kind of left the door open there with, with his remarks, but also stated very clearly that they want to stay in the Pac-12 and Arizona State said the same thing. And, it, you know, time has passed several days, as a matter of fact, I think that was about a week ago, since all those comments came out. And it, it got me thinking, why would all those comments come out at the same time if they didn't have anything, if they weren't actually close? Well, they might not actually be close. They might have all just been providing cover for George Klyovkov. That is a, a very, I think, legitimate and fair opinion, not one that I hold, but if you have that thought, I think that's pretty reasonable. I think the reason those comments came out is because they actually thought they were, and I bet you we're just not hearing about it because George Klyovkov has been so tight-lipped. I bet you there was either a setback or a major positive development that they wanted to keep on the wraps. I think one of those is far more likely than they were just you know, running some cover at that point in time. I think they actually thought and perhaps still think that the deal is in its final stages of negotiation. It can get to where they want it to be to keep the conference together. But something had to have happened for the deal to have not been announced several days after. It could be really good. It could be really bad. But I think something changed behind the curtain that we have not seen, that we have not heard about. And look, it could be that George K has just got a trick up his sleeve that none of us see coming. And maybe that's when they found out about her. They found out shortly thereafter with all the comments and everything. Hard to say at this point in time. But that to me is an intriguing development to say the least. And I am, am very ready. I'm very, very ready for the media deal to come out. We're all ready for it. My curiosity has been more than peaked. It's been exhausted completely drained at this point. I just want to know. I don't care if it's $25 million per year per school. Let's get some concrete information, please and thank you, and assess how we go forward from there. Appreciate everyone listening. See you next time. Have a great weekend and have a wonderful rest of your day.